accustomed to putting other people's needs before mine. Hey, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and today I'm joined by a good friend of mine, Mr. Nishan Grout. If you've never checked out our website before, you should. WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. Good stuff over there. Photos, video, links, transcripts. Sign up for the newsletter. Find the sort of secret Facebook group that we have for the show. Lots of stuff. More than I can even remember right now. Have you ever noticed the intros and the outros are always a little different? It's because there's so much stuff going on that I don't remember at all. And I don't want to rehearse it. I like these coming off the cuff. I've gotten better at that. And you know what's off the cuff? This episode. They all are. But in today's episode, my friend Mr. Grout, and I like calling him my friend, because especially after this episode, I feel closer to him. You know, I've known this man for several years, but the things that he shares on today's episode were some of the deepest, most honest, authentic stories that anyone has shared on this show in over three years. And the fact that he felt comfortable talking to me about these things, I can't help but feel closer, can't help but feeling more friendly to him. It was an honor, truly. I don't know what else I can say, so I'm going to say nothing and just step back and welcome him to the show. Mr. Grout, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. How are you today, Jeremy? I'm great. Great. Thanks for sitting down with me. We're, we're in a little bit of an echoey space, but that, that just kind of adds to the, the authenticity of it. I mean, who knows? I don't know how well the echo is or isn't going to show up on there, but that's okay. Because it'll make people feel like they're right there in the next chair. We're, we're sitting in metal chairs and just... You know, relaxing. Yeah. So the place we have to start, I know you, I know you've listened to the show, but we've got to start in a place that honestly, I'm, I don't even know the beginning of your martial arts journey, which is funny because I've known you for, I don't remember how many years. A while. And, yeah. And so I'm almost embarrassed that I have to ask this, but at the same time, it's good because it puts me in the same place as the listeners. So how did, how did your start, your, your martial arts journey start? Back around the beginning of elementary school, uh, my mother was really into martial arts movies. Uh, Mid eighties, who wasn't? <laughs> Van Damme movies. Van Damme, Bruce Lee, okay. everybody, the whole gambit. Nice. And so I showed a lot of interest in them, mm. and. She signed me up for Shaolin Kempo Karate with Master Freddie LePan. Who's been on the show. Absolutely. Uh, studied with him off and on for years and then took quite the long break. Um, didn't actually end up getting back into martial arts until my son was born and my wife decided to get back into Taekwondo, which she had done for several years. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I used to do martial arts. That'll be a fun thing to do together. Uh, went to a Taekwondo class with her and was hooked. I've been going to study with uh, Master Joe Lenahan, who's also been, who's on, also the show, been on the show uh, ever since then. All right, nice. You know, it's not too often that, that a couple has a baby and then says, you know what, let's add something to our now dramatically busier lives. What was it about having a kid that she said, oh, we have to go to Taekwondo? For her, I think it was stress relief and getting <laughs> okay. away from the kid. <laughs> okay. uh, for me, it was that so much was then revolving around at that point the three children mm. that I felt like we didn't really have a whole lot that we were doing together anymore. Sure. So in an effort to not take away from my kids, I was like, well, I want to do things with you. I want to do things with my kids. I'll go once a week. 
instead of the twice a week. Sure. And that was the arrangement that we went with for quite a while. Um, that didn't change until actually I tore my ACL, um, not doing Taekwondo. Was and it something dumb? It was. You have to say what it was. It was something just, unfortunate. Oh, okay. um, I was traveling with a university paintball club <laughs> to an event down in Connecticut in the winter. Mm. And I was running down a hill into this <sighs> village that they had. It was a yeah. scenario game based on the Eastern Front. Okay. And the closer I got to the building the, at the top of the hill, I was sure I wanted to be hiding behind. The more I knew I didn't want to be behind that building. Okay. Um, I planted my right foot to turn to the left. Everything went out from underneath me. I heard a pop and I laid there thinking that wasn't good. Mm -hmm. And then I started getting shot. <laughs> <laughs> insult to injury literally Be because i'm right in the middle of a firefight on the ground behind nothing and i got up and i hobbled my way up to the top of the hill where i wasn't getting shot anymore a ref coming at came and asked me if i needed any help i was stubborn and said no mm. i went back to the staging area and that's where i spent the rest of the day um until we finally got back to vermont and I went and saw the doctor and found out that I had completely torn my ACL. Wow. Running in the cold down a hill does not, doesn't sound like there's a, a lot of option for it to go another well, way. I mean, that was, yeah. It was a recipe for disaster yeah. to be sure. Okay. So how did that change the frequency you were going to class? Because it was good in addition to my physical therapy. After I had my ACL replaced, went to physical therapy a lot, was really getting back into things. Getting my next belt became kind of a bigger goal for me because I had that extra thing that I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, wanted to prove to myself that I could still do it. I convinced my wife that it was good for my knee. She agreed. So I switched to going to every class um, on top of the physical therapy appointments that I was going to mm. two, three yeah. times a week. So, And so how, how long into your martial arts journey was that? Or, or into your, your second stint, your, your Taekwondo I, stint? I was getting ready to test for my high blue belt in Taekwondo. Okay. Um, and oddly enough, Looking back at it, that was probably the easiest testing I had ever. Not because obviously the lower ranking tests are easier, but I was in so much better shape mm. because of the physical therapy and the extra work I was doing at home. Sure. And, okay. So here you've taken, a, you know, at that point you take a, another step in, you jump in, go a little deeper into the pool so to speak. Now you're going more than once a week. What are, what are the next, whatever, what's that next period of time look like? How, other than being in better physical condition, you know, is this scratching more of an itch for you that you're, you're going more often now? I, I was really enjoying being there all the time. The kids weren't quite as young, quite as needy. Mm. The grandparents really liked having time with them. Cool. Um, and I didn't feel that same fresh new dad uh, guilt as I did when I first started leaving their sides. Yeah. Okay. So it was good for everybody, nice. <laughs> including the kids, to get me off their back. Nice. Now, from what I know of you now, and even the little bit that, you, that you've said, it's very clear that martial arts is something is something that belongs in your life. It's something that is, has kind of become core to who you are. I mean, there, there are quite a few pieces revolving around it. We had, we had, you know, a bit of a sidebar conversation before we started recording. Maybe we get into some of that and maybe we don't totally mm -hmm. fine, but you had quite the hiatus between your time training, 
with Master Lapan and your time training with Master Lenahan. Mm -hmm. Were you aware that this was something that you were, I mean, is missing the right word? I think I was not at first. Well, at first, absolutely. I grew away from it. Um, come from a fairly low income family. Couldn't always afford the classes, mm -hmm. which means come 15 years old, old enough to work on a farm. Mm -hmm. That's where I was working. As soon as I was old enough to work at a restaurant, I was working at a restaurant, worked my way through high school, um, actually dropped out of college because of working. Um, mm -hmm. I spent one year in college. At the end of the year, I was like, I've worked so much. I haven't actually retained mm -hmm. much of this stuff. And yeah, the piece of paper is going to get me a job, but what I learn is going to keep the job for me. So I dropped out of college, went back to work, um, went back, finished my associate's degree afterwards. And uh, really toyed with the idea of going back a lot, visited a school occasionally, but never really clicked. Okay. Can you... Are you willing, to, not not the where, but are you willing to speak to the the why? What wasn't clicking? I think it was for me that I was concerned about tying up much of my income. Mm. That, that's something that's always really kind of been a sticking point for me. Um, when I was younger, we had a house that our family, quite frankly, outgrew. Mm. Um, three boys in one bedroom is a recipe for disaster like no other. A literal disaster. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, nothing but fighting, nothing but yeah. messes. My parents made the right choice in getting a different house, bigger house. Mm. That ended up not working out. Mm. We ended up spending a summer living out of tents yeah. and a winter living on a friend of the family's couch, essentially. Um, tying up money since then and big changes in life has been something that I have a hard time with since then. It's an experience that I, I haven't had to go through. Um, and one of the things we haven't talked on the show much about was um, I grew up in a lower income home. It was just my mother and I, and, and she made the decision when when I was young that she would work for herself. I mean, no surprise. I'm a multi-time business owner that does tend to go through the family. But what you're describing, your, your kind of attitudes in terms of, of being conservative and just the way you're talking about your children remind me a bit of my, my mother, you know, some of the, some of that kind of, uh, um, depression era stuff that stepped down to my mother. I mean, you know, obviously different generations, but I, I can certainly relate to it uh, as much as I can not having gone through it. Mm -hmm. So I, I see I mean, what you're it, saying. The priorities yeah. are pretty important, especially when you know, there's a, there's a family. When, when, when did the first children come into the mix? Um, all of the children came into the mix at the same time. Okay. Uh, my two daughters are from my wife's first marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are absolutely mine. <laughs> sure. I've seen you with them. I... Um, yeah. they're both teenage girls now, so I'm not cool enough to be seen with. <laughs> Um, and usually the bane of their existence. That's a, that's a but, father's prerogative. But they're very much mine. Yeah. Even they know it. Good. Okay. So you're, you're, you're looking for the right school. If, if I can rephrase what you're saying, I, I think, I think I, I hear what you're saying that you're will, you're resistant to spending the funds to, you know, taking those away from your family. But if you find the right school, 
you're willing to let that happen. Is that is that what I'm hearing from you? Um, looking to go back was prior to the family. Oh, okay. Um, so prior to meeting my wife and gaining the family, um, I did go and check a few local schools out and I always found excuses not to go either. It was too expensive or the timing didn't work out or I wasn't terribly interested in the style. Mm. Um, oddly enough, one of the schools that I went to was a different Taekwondo school in this area. Mm -hmm. um, this was far prior to the family. Yeah. And I never saw myself as a Taekwondo practitioner. Mm. There are lots of jumpy, spinny kicks that are really high in Taekwondo. And I've never been terribly flexible. Never really saw the point in the flashier stuff. Um, I'm working on the flexibility. It's gotten a lot better um, since one of my testings where you told me that I should get spend some time in a sauna and really start stretching. <laughs> that sounds like something I would say. Um <laughs> It's still something that I struggle with a lot. Yeah. Um, but I'm getting there. Good. That, that's one of my big goals for my next testing. If we look back on this time, and, and, and I'm 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 focused on this because I, I I think there's some some interesting stuff that the listeners might might hear that might resonate for people, especially people who are earlier in their martial arts journey. If we look back on that time where you're checking out other schools and and in your words, making excuses for why you're not going. Was there was there something maybe deeper? Maybe you weren't ready to go back? It, it, it almost sounds like it's something you felt you should do, but you didn't, you consciously thought you should do, but maybe in your heart you didn't believe it was time or you didn't, you, you just weren't there yet. Yeah, to something along those lines. Okay. I, I can't break down the psychology of it, but I'm right. sure you're on to something there. Yeah. Um, there was definitely part of me that felt like I should get back into it, but something was stopping me. Okay. And, and I, I, I think it's only clear to me because of the contrast, because you, you, tear your ACL and now you're going to class more, you know, and knowing what I know of you as a martial arts and your, your dedication now and your involvement, your wife, your children and, and other aspects. I mean, it, it's such a 180 that there was some transition there and, and maybe, you know, maybe you don't know what it is and, and maybe, you know, if you don't know where it is, we're certainly not going to figure it out in the next however many minutes. Absolutely. But there's, there's something there that, I don't know. I'm guessing the listeners can hear it too, but anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's really how I got into, out of, and back into Taekwondo <laughs> or martial arts. Yeah. Um, and really the choice of Taekwondo, I still don't know that it fits entirely for the aforementioned reasons. Mm. Um, but it's absolutely adopted me mm. since my wife brought me into it because she was very much, she's going back to Taekwondo or not back to martial arts at all. Right. Um, so if I want to do martial arts and I want to do them with my wife, I was going to become a ta Taekwondo practitioner. Well, I've always said, and I, I know you've heard me say that it's, it's, you choose the, the school, the instructor, and the people, not the style. If you choose the style, you're, you're going to go wrong much more often than the other way. And, you know, I know your Taekwondo instructor, and you know your Taekwondo instructor. And longtime listeners know your Taekwondo instructor because he was episode 10, 11. I mean, it was, it was pretty early on. 20. Yeah. Yeah. I remember roughly when, when we did that one. And, um, Interestingly, the 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 other episode that's been recorded in a Masonic Lodge. 
Don't, there have only been two. They've both been in person and in a, in a whole different one. So we've heard about you with martial arts. We've heard about paintball. We've heard about injuries. And those are all, those are all good stories. And whether it involves your, your wife or not, I'm, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm not fishing for anything because I don't, I don't know. But families that train together tend to have some interesting stories, especially around the um, kind of the, the, the flux in authority, we can say. Because did, does, she, does she still outrank you? No. Okay. All right. But she did for quite a long time. She did for a very long time until yeah. recently. All right. Um, she outranked me until I received my second stripe. Okay. Um, and when I did receive that second stripe, she had a really hard time with it. T tell me about that. Um, so probably at this point, seven years ago. Okay. Um, at work, my wife, Tony hurt her back mm. and back injuries are tricky things as yeah. anybody that's ever had one knows, um, misdiagnoses, uh, concern from physicians that she was just hunting for pills, yeah. trips to the doctor. There was one trip to... The emergency room that culminated in a week-long stay in uh, the largest local hospital Ugh. before she, they would leave, let her leave because she could walk again. She couldn't stand. She Ooh. couldn't. We. I need to get help to physically get her into the vehicle to rush her to the emergency room um, because she couldn't get out of bed. And they refused to let her leave the hospital until... She could walk 20 feet and up through stairs because that's what she needed to be able to do to get into the house. Um, that makes it difficult to train Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. um, so she was unable to train Taekwondo. And that's when I caught up to and surpassed her in rank. Mm. Um she had a hard time with it, um, understandably. How about you? Yes. Because here, here she's the reason that you started training again. Um, and I've, I've honestly had a hard time with it since she stopped. Uh, just our, even participating? Even participating. Okay. Our kids participating for a while made it easier. Um but with no one else in the family participating, uh, I honestly, between that and being a black belt and the certain level of contentment that often creeps its way in there, sure. I've had a hard time some nights just getting to class. Talk about what that, what that, feels like or what thoughts are going through your head that make that difficult all before class my mind will go through all of the things that i could be doing around the house with my wife with my daughters with my son and i'm back to the point when we first started where i feel like it's taking more time away from my family than mm. what I'm getting out of it. Like I would get myself and my family together would get more out of it if I were not at class, okay. uh, which is a strange place. I'm very accustomed to putting other people's needs before mine, but it's weird to have Taekwondo be that thing that's taking away from family and not 
Taekwondo martial arts in general, as we've all said and heard you say, you get out of it exactly what you put into it. I like to think I put quite a bit into it and to still have that feeling that that's not as much as what you can get out of being with your family is strange. Did they ever pressure you? My wife pressures me continuously to go to class. Okay, so even in the direction to counter this feeling, the family's pushing you to go to class and you're still having that feeling. Yes. My, uh, they've always been very supportive of it. Um, e- even so, it just... The, there's a level of contentment there. Like, I've gone further than honestly I expected to already and kids grow up quickly it's easy Mm. to feel like you're missing it so that makes it a lot easier to talk myself out of going to class yeah yeah I'm realizing there's a pattern here of talking myself out of things. Well, that, I mean, that's one pattern, but the, the other one I'm seeing that I'm pretty sure is, is the most driving force for who you are is your consideration for other people. I mean, that's up until now. I mean, we're, you know, 20 something minutes in and, and you've told three or four stories about either your putting others first or your admiration for your parents putting the kids first. I mean, that that's pretty core to who you are. So that makes all kinds of sense. It, it really should be about other people and the community. Um, there's nothing that you can gain during life that you're going to take with you. Yeah. Might as well help people that are going to be around after you. Yeah, leaving a legacy. Um, I, I have no illusions that I'm going to be remembered for generations, but it'd be nice to know when I'm older and not able to do all the things that I can do now that I helped some other people get through some tough times. Yeah. Well, it sounds like at the same, the same vein that you're putting your family first, they're trying to put you first. And pushing you out the door to make sure that you go and you train. Either that or they're sick of listening to me (laughs) complain about them not doing their chores. (laughs) Well, maybe both. It could be both. It could be. Absolutely. Everybody wins. (laughs) Nice. What else are you into besides martial arts and paintball? Um, Big into paintball. Have been for years. Martial arts. Um, I'm actually master of the lodge that we're sitting in right now, um, which was also the lodge that my grandfather was the master of. Other than that, I work and I dabble at a bar. Um, now, what does dabble mean? Because that, dabbling at a bar I, could mean, mean fair, different things to different fair, people. Fair enough. I work part-time I have for 14 years as a bouncer and doorman, and I've just started uh, learning to bartend. So it's kind of a fun little thing that I'm doing for myself. Now, how does the, the working the door, the bouncing at a bar, how does that relate to martial arts? We've heard some stories on this show about folks who either it, it usually seems to go in the other direction. They start martial arts and then they end up working the door someplace because someone finds out that they can handle themselves. I, but you're the opposite. I started there because they opened a kitchen mm-hmm. and I had a falling out with my previous manager mm-hmm. who cut my hours overnight from 60 hours a week to 10. Oh. And I got a call within a week saying that the owner of this bar had heard that I was looking for work. And I said, yes. And he said, come see me. And I had a job instantly. Cool. 
So I helped to run the kitchen for three years. They decided that the kitchen really wasn't working out the way that they thought it was going to. They were going to close the kitchen and asked me if I wanted to stay on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I started working at the door. There are absolutely some stories there. Yeah. How can there not be? It's alcohol and it's people and you are the first line of defense. Um, Now, I think we should set the tone for the audience. Now, while I have... I have sparred with you and you are certainly competent in that way. And, and of, if I was to make a list of people that I would want to get into a fight with, you are nowhere near the top, but neither of us are large people. Neither of us are people that when, if someone is filling out their, their dream team of people to work a door and work security at a bar, we're not going to be in the top few slots. Not going to make the top hundred. (laughs) Okay. I'm I'm glad we're on the same page. Yeah. So I'm sure that that has something to do with it too. Does that contribute to the stories? It it does. Okay. Um, Possibly in a different way than what you're thinking though. All right. Uh, For a while, I worked with a bouncer that was a Marine fresh back from tour. Mm -hmm. Uh, And his biceps are as big as my head. (laughs) And more people wanted to fight him than wanted to so much as argue with me. Interesting. Because they want to prove something. They want to prove that the big guy can't tell them what to do. There's nothing to prove if the little guy doesn't tell them. Beating me up to the average drunk is nothing because I'm not a big guy. Okay. Um, When I started there, there were quite a few fights. It was a different time. There was a lot more fighting in bars in general in this area at that time. I helped break up a lot of fights. Um, We're in a really rural area. There's not a lot to do when you're younger. Sure. One of the things that my friends and I used to do is get together behind somebody's house and just wrestle for hours. No formal training whatsoever. Anybody that does jujitsu, anything like that, mop the floor with me all day long. But I take a lot of pride in the fact that 14 years working at a bar, breaking up fights, I've never hit anyone. Mm. I've never kicked anyone. Nice. Grabbed a hold of some people, escorted some people out by their head. I have never had to hit or kick anyone. Never had to injure anyone. Never injured anyone. That's great. Some people have woken up sore, I'm sure. Yeah. But I've never injured anyone. Um, and that's a big thing for that's me. That's a pretty solid accomplishment. I mean, and, and kind of like you said, almost the opposite of what... I think a lot of people would expect that as a smaller man, more people would want to test you because you seem to be an easy target. But then again, someone gets a few drinks in them and they're looking to prove something and you're not someone that they're going to go around bragging that they've hit. So what's the point? I'm going to brag. I beat up the Marine with the biceps as big as my head. Exactly. Except that they didn't. I'm sure. (laughs) No, they absolutely did not. Um, And I grew up in this area. So a lot of the people that I'm kicking out are people I went to school with. Yeah. People who are children of teachers that I had. Um, One such 21st birthday party. Student of a former teacher of mine. Got kicked out. Next thing I know, he's in the bar. Like, how'd you get back in the bar? Oh, well, he jumped the fence. We've got a backyard that's all fenced in. You can drink in the backyard. <laughs> he climbed the 20 foot fence somehow and ended up back in. How he didn't break his neck jumping over the fence is beyond me, but he made it back in. So he went back out. Next time in, 
he's back in there. <laughs> His buddy let him in through the side door. So finally, listen, now your entire group needs to leave. And I found the sober guy, talked to the sober guy. I'm like, listen, you've pushed your luck as far as you can push your luck. He's got to go. You got to get him out of here because he won't stay out. Yeah. 10, 15 minutes later, he's still in the parking lot. He wants to fight his friends. He wants to fight the cops. He wants to fight me. And I just told him, look, you've got three choices at this point. We can call the cops and you can spend the night in jail. You can come back up this ramp and we can fight and you can probably spend the night in the hospital. Or you can let your friend take you home and you can spend the night in your bed. Mm. Um, his friends all knew me from school. I had a little bit of a reputation in school and his friends dragged him out of the parking lot and brought him home. So that ended really well for everybody. So what's, what's this reputation? Were you a, a rougher youth? Um, I got to that point. Yeah. So, of course, small town, yeah. poor family, people are going to get picked on. Yeah. Uh, my graduating class was all of 22 people. Wow. So very small area. Everybody knows everybody. If you're not at the top of the food chain, you get picked on yeah. or you suck up to the ones at the top of the food chain to not get picked on. I don't suck up. So I took a lot of bullying for a long time. Um, and my parents were very much of the philosophy that if you ignore it, it will go away. So I ignored it for about three years and it just never went away. And I honestly couldn't tell you to save my life what it was. But somebody said something in sixth grade and I snapped hmm. and I, I got into a fight, went to the principal's office. Principal said, did you hit him? Yes. Did you hit him? Yes. You're both suspended for three days. Very cut and dry. But I made the decision that day that it wasn't going to go away and that I wasn't going to take it. Yeah. So if somebody was going to run their mouth, I was going to run my mouth back. But that was the last time I was ever gonna throw the first punch. If you're gonna run your mouth, I'll run my mouth back. If you wanna fight, I'll fight. I told my dad that I made that decision. And he got very serious and told me that it didn't matter how big I thought I was, not big, how fast I thought I was, how good of a fighter I thought I was, I was always going to find someone bigger, faster, better. It was inevitable. It was going to happen. Well, being young and dumb, I decided it's, an ine it's inevitable. Why try to avoid it? So I spent the next year getting in so many fights that I almost got expelled from the school. Just people pushing me, I'd push back and it would escalate. But the next year, nobody messed with me. I stood up for myself. I showed them that I wasn't going to be an easy target. And I stayed true to what I said was that whether or not I won that fight, because dad told me it was inevitable that I was going to lose one, they were going to know that they were in a fight. So I ended up as a reputation, somebody that you didn't mess with. Hmm. Occasionally I got into a fight when there was a new kid in the school and they wanted to, somebody talked them into it to see if they'd get beat up or they wanted to try and beat up somebody. 
I'm not a great fighter by any means. But as somebody who spent his hum- summer throwing bales of hay, working in a hay field, had previously trained in martial arts, and wrestled his friends for fun, at that age, I was pretty decent. Yeah. That sounds like a pretty good recipe for, um, for a I, school I was able fighter. to take care of myself. Yeah. Um, and again, in small areas, the fish always ends up a lot bigger by the time somebody right. else hears about it. Right. Right. Um, you don't seem super comfortable, isn't the right word? Because you're certainly comfortable talking about this. You don't seem like you're holding back, but it almost seems like you're you're kind of reliving some some elements of this, and and it seems like there might be some emotion popping up for you. It, this is one of the advantages of yeah, us conducting it, this live. It was I can see your unpleasant. face. Unpleasant. Um, it was really unpleasant, and looking back at it, I think if truth be told. I actually ended up swinging to the other end of the pendulum at times. Um, I think looking back at it, there were times where I was probably the bullier. Mm. Um, How does that feel now to to see that? Like hell. Yeah. Um, Even more so because in at least some of the instances, it was people that... I felt were my good friends and I felt like we were just joking around, but in looking back at it, it was not reciprocal. Hmm. Um, There was one kid that I went to school with that looking back at it, I mean, we've, we've considered ourselves friends looking back at it. There were certainly points where I was bullying him. Um, And I don't know if this happens anywhere else on the face of the planet, but the school I went to, if you get suspended so many times for fighting, you're expelled. You fail all your classes and you're expelled. So the big thing used to be, oh, well, we'll go meet at the driveway next door after school so that we're off school property fighting and we can't get suspended for it. This friend that I look back at, and I certainly bullied, was also the same guy who agreed to a fight that he most definitely was going to lose. There was no doubt about it. With with you or with someone else? With someone else. Oh, okay. And I remember going up to him and being like, when do you want me to step in? Hmm. I'll, I'll be there for you. I'll stop it whenever you want me to stop it. How old are you at this point? I was probably a sophomore or a junior in high school. Um, And he said, if somebody else steps in, I'm like, so if if he's really wailing on you, you don't, you're like, no. As long as it's a fair fight, if he beats me up, he beats me up. It's on me. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and sure enough, he went to that fight and he got beat up and nobody else stepped in, but it was like, there were two groups of people there, each supporting one side of that fight. And there was certainly the potential for disaster there. Yeah. Um, and I remember my friend's dad showing up, um, pretty much as the fight was over, um, and giving us looking, I felt directly at me, but really just at the group um, and saying that he was really disappointed in all of us. And I did what my friend asked me to do. Um, So I have a clear conscience about that. Um, That person never messed with him again, though. Hmm. He stood up for himself. He wasn't an easy target. There were easier targets, less trouble more fun now that you're a parent how do these experiences you know 
filter down into the way you're raising your children? So a few years back, my daughter was doing track. And there was another person on the track team that she had a lot of trouble with in class. And she came over and she complained that this person was pushing her and grabbing her hair. I'm like, you need to tell the coach. Okay. She goes, she tells the coach. A few minutes later, she comes back. Still doing it. What did the coach do? Nothing. Let's go tell the coach again. She goes, she talks to the coach. She comes back a few minutes later. He's still doing it. If he pulls your hair, you pull his hair. If he pushes you, you push him. If he punches you, you punch him. Like you tried the proper channels. They didn't work. Now you need to stick up for yourself. And she's like, but I'm going to get in trouble. I'm like if you get in trouble, I will go speak to the coach. Yeah. And I will find the kid's parents and I will speak to his parents because it's not acceptable. But us getting involved is not going to change things the way you sticking up for yourself is going to change them. And about three minutes later, this kid went flying over three gear bags because she pushed him so hard. And that was the last time that he messed with her. The way you're talking about handling yourself is is pretty i mean it, it's spot on to the way i was raised right and and you know we're similar in age and and unfortunately person that's my personal feeling unfortunately the way bullying i mean we'll kind of lump it all under that heading is handled these days is very different than what it was when we were kids you know and um you know my my mother taught me my martial arts school taught me until someone is actually trying to hurt you, you don't use anything. You use your words, you avoid the situation, you back up, get out of there, you run, whatever you've got to do. But the moment someone crosses that line, you do what you got to do. You know, I'm kind of reminded of the, the quote in, what is it, Karate Kid 1 or 2 from Miyagi, best not fight, if fight, win. Yes. Right? I mean, that's, that's how I was raised. That's how it sounds like you were raised. And I think without schools being able to set their own rules, every martial arts school would probably set those same conditions for their students. And, and I suspect most of them permit that. But schools don't always look at it that way. Schools look at it as it doesn't matter if you're the first person to, to, to fight. You know, the Second person, person who usually gets caught. The, the person who defends themselves, defends their well-being is often equally guilty the person who initiated it because apparently getting the snot beat out of you while you lay prone on the ground is a better choice to some of these administrators. Uh, there's a topic I could get very ranty about, but I won't. Absolutely. Um, Does your knowledge of martial arts and the fact that your children have been through martial arts and your, your wife, the mother of your children, is a martial artist, does that change the way you look at this? Would you offer the same advice to your children if you weren't a martial artist? If she Had, had she trained at that point? She only trained very briefly. Okay. Um, High yellow belt, I believe. Okay. Or I'm sorry, high white belt, I believe, is as far okay. as she got. In. So very little. Very little. Um, absolutely. Okay. That that advice comes all the way back from my experience. Okay. That if, if the proper channels are going to take care of the problem, absolutely. Let them do it. That is by far preferable. Because normally the person that reacts to the instigator is the one that gets caught. And in the most trouble. Yeah. Um, so, but I mean, if they're not going to take care of it, then one way or another, you've got to make it so that you are not the easiest target. Somebody's going to be an easy target. If you're able to help those people, absolutely do it. I've done it. I hope that if my kids had to ever end up 
in that situation, they'll call a bully out and try and help somebody that's getting bullied. Whether it's physical, verbal, it's got to be what works for you. But you need to stand up for yourself and not be the easy target. Yeah. It's hard. It's it's a hard decision. It's hard to... It's hard to get older and see that bullying still exists. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced it in your adult life, which is just utterly ridiculous to me. Uh, I, I, I deal with it. I even deal with it in the martial arts community, which I find so baffling. Let's switch gears. Let's, let's talk about some, some lighter subjects Absolutely. for a little while. <laughs> if you could train with anybody that you haven't anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, who would that be? I'm a horrible guest in that I didn't double check on this gentleman's name. It's okay. But a couple years back, uh, Daniel Hartz hosted what he called an island day. Mm. And we got together and trained outdoors in the grass all day. And a gentleman from Maine, Mr. Wynn, I can't remember his first name. Aaron. Aaron Wynn came in. And the level of excitement and just pure joy in his entire body as he swings a stick at you (laughs) so fast, it's going to break something if you don't block it. Yeah is infectious Mm. out of everybody honestly if not him someone with that same personality Mm. but i i would definitely enjoy training with him the one time that i got to train with him that day um, i really enjoyed it it is probably on par with the level of energy and enthusiasm uh, that Bill Wallace had when we did the seminar Mm. down in Rutland. Yeah. Um, It was very much that same feeling, just in a smaller group. Sure. Sure. I've I've had the opportunity, unfortunately, only once to train with with Master Wynn, and and he has not been on the show, and would love to have him on the show, and and he certainly... um, has a, has a standing invitation. We've, we've had a, a very small amount of contact, but I knew of him by reputation long before I had met him and ended up at an event in Maine and was sitting next to him and then went, oh, you're new. <laughs> and he said, yeah, how do you know who I am? And so managed to explain that I knew Mr. Hartz and, and Mr. Earl Smith. And um, yeah, yeah, he's like a big kid. Absolutely. I mean, he is he, the kid. The kids at this particular event loved him. I'm sure in the same way that that you did, because yeah, his passion is absolutely infectious. Is that something you find you respond to a lot in life? It's just people that are very passionate yeah. about things. People that are passionate and people that can make. I mean, swinging those sticks is dangerous, and yeah. he makes. He makes it fun. He, all the danger out of it just disappears. It, he's smiling. It's fun. He shows you exactly what you need to do. Mm. And he's proficient enough in it that there's absolutely no doubt in your mind that as long as you do what you were told, it's going to be fun. Mm. It's not just going to be safe. It's going to be fun. Nice. How about competition? Is that ever? Not really. No. Um, Why not? I've done two or three okay. uh, tournaments here in the uh, Vermont area. I didn't start doing competitions until I was already a black belt. 
And the reality of it is if I didn't have to go in order to coax the other students into going, I probably wouldn't have done it then. Uh, I'm considering getting into forms and possibly board breaking competition um, just on some of the local ones. But not sparring. But not sparring. Okay. Um, for me, there's too much of the margin for error and the chance of getting hurt is just too big. Um, even with the head issue, or even with the headgear, yeah. um, when I was a senior in high school, November 13th, 1999 at 3.49 in the morning. Clearly a significant moment in time. Um, I was involved in a car accident mm. on my way to volunteer at a hunter's breakfast for a church in Greensboro Bend. And I died. Um, uh, Barry in the lead on this episode. I, I, <laughs> I um, was driving a 1987 Buick Skyhawk two-door coupe. And I lost control of the vehicle going around a corner. The vehicle fishtailed. And I went over the yellow line to be T-boned by a brand new 2000 Chevy Suburban mm. that was converted into a hearse mm. and was carrying a casket to Connecticut for a funeral. Morbid and a little bit funny. Uh, my my stepmother and I laugh about it. She, uh, she can't help but wonder if they had to notify next of kin. <laughs> Um, out of that, I ended up with a hand crushed to the point that I needed four, yes, four metal rods in it, a broken collarbone, a punctured lung, some broken ribs. My skull was fractured in seven places. Um, and I had cerebral fluid leaking from my left ear. I had to learn to walk again, talk again, the whole nine yards. My memory still shot from it. Wow. Um, I had an air pocket on my brain. The, the danger of getting hit in the head hmm. and suffering another injury like that just is not worth it to me. How much of that is physical concern and how much of it is... I'll be blunt, fear. Most of it is likely fear. Okay. Um, the damage is already there. I, I'm not willing to take the risk that something goes wrong and it gets worse. Sure. Um, the odds of it actually happening, pretty slim. I mean, the headgear's good. The refs are good. The contact is low. It would have to be a pretty serious accident to happen. Yeah. But I've been in pretty serious accidents. They happen. Right. So I'm just not willing to take the chance. Yeah. I've done it a couple times. It's just not for me. Sure. The reason I, I, I asked, the reason I kind of pushed on the sparring piece mm -hmm. is because of of the events at martial arts competition, that tends to be where the most adrenaline is. And if you're participating in paintball, I've done paintball a little bit, and I know that the adrenaline is through the roof. And most of the people I know that love paintball, it's because of that rush. Absolutely, and it's great. Um, but yeah, I'm just... It, it, and I've toyed with the idea of trying MMA, but for the same reason, it's mm. just the, the chances of a head injury. Yeah. Um, for me, especially with the kids still very much needing support, if nothing else, or me to open the wallet occasionally in the case of the teenagers, it's just not worth it for me. Yeah. 
I understand. And I'm not that good at it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Moving forward, what are your goals? So beginning next month, uh, if all goes well, my wife and I are opening our own Taekwondo school. Cool. Uh, right in the right in the same location that our instructor just closed his school. How much of your... No, I'll ask it a different way. Is this something that you two had talked about prior to that? It's something she has dreamed about since she was 12 years old Ooh. and that I had never really given any thought. Okay. So there's another point where the two of you are connecting on martial arts. Absolutely. Exciting. Absolutely. And uh, obviously we're not going to agree on everything, but we're going into this making sure that we agree on enough that it's going to work. It's not going to be a contentious issue in our marriage or in our training. Yeah. Um, and our instructor um, is fully supportive of it. Cool. And the other students of the school are all supportive of it. They're nice. all very excited. Nice. Yeah. It, I did warn them that I'm a hack and I'm not the martial artist that Master Lenahan is, but that we will do our best. Most people are not. He's a, he is a, he's a good man. He's an exceptional man. Absolutely. Cool. And I suspect at some point, and, and possibly even before this airs, the school will have a website or a Facebook page or something, some way to get a hold of you. Uh, at this point, we have an email address. Okay. But that's about it. We will have a Facebook page okay. sooner rather than later. All right. So then I guess I'll just tell people that are listening, go to the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, find the notes for this episode, and... I suspect by the time it's up, there will be, we'll have some kind of link there. Absolutely. Go to the show notes <laughs> and read about how to get a hold of us. <laughs> no, the best part is, um, so, you know, we, we, we just talked about it. I wanted to make sure you, you're the one that brought the, con brought the topic up. But when we sat down to talk about this, listeners should know, I didn't know that was happening. Nobody you know, did no, it. Very, very, this, this has been very quiet. And so the release of this episode is going to be fairly close to the, the time where you're going to start speaking about this publicly. You know, we, we talked about a kind of a soft launch, you know, just working out some of the kinks, bringing in the, the existing students or, or, so to speak, the old students from Master Lenahan School. And then, you know, after a few weeks of that, talking about it more openly. And this is going to pretty closely correlate with that, which is super fun because it was completely unplanned. And I love when stuff like that. Absolutely. The only, organically. the only people other than filing paperwork and whatnot, the only people in the martial arts community that know about it really are the existing students um, and the person that we will be training with. Yeah. Nice. Until this airs anyway. Right. Right. As of Thanks. about 30 seconds ago. Yeah. <laughs> big news. Big stuff. Awesome. All right. And you know how we send it out. So what, what words do you want to give to the people listening? What parting advice? Parting advice for people has got to be to make sure that you present your best self to people. It, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Present yourself well. Meet everybody on equal level with you. And they'll prove to either be worthy of being on that level or they won't. And if they're not, then you really don't need them in your life. If they're on the same level with you, if they are putting effort into their lives and trying to be good people, help them out. People that do that seem to naturally seek each other out, mm. even if it's just random circumstance. 
and we're all better for it. We, we need to realize that we're part of a larger organization, a larger community, a larger organism. And unless we all work together, it all just kind of, kind of falls apart. When we talk about the martial arts relating to every aspect of life, I think this is a good episode. There's so much context to who this man is. that comes from his martial arts training and that when you train with him, because I've been fortunate enough to train with him on a number of occasions, more than nearly anyone that's been on the show, you can see that come through in the way he conducts himself. This is someone who loves martial arts, but as you heard, maybe didn't know how strongly a place in his life it needed that he deserved it to have however you want to look at it. Well, I'm glad he's found it. I'm glad that he's continuing his path, his journey, and I'm excited to get to watch because I live nearby. Thank you so much, Mr. Grout, for coming on the show today. I'd love for you to head on over to the show notes, maybe leave a comment under this episode. Tell us what you thought, or if you're more comfortable, you can go ahead, you can email me privately, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And of course, we have social media all over the place. We are at Whistlekick, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And I won't say their name because they didn't give me permission and I didn't ask. But recently, one of our more public guests from the show in the past said in comment on our Instagram feed that ours is one of his favorites. This was completely unsolicited. Made my day. And I sent it over to the media team and it made their day too. So, yay. Super cool. We have fun with what we do. Hopefully that comes through. If you want to check out the products, the other stuff we have fun doing, find it at whistlekick.com. And of course, I will see you soon, whether that be in your ears or maybe around at an event. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. What? Yeah.